doing all of this in the spirit of being true public servants. Thank you to these healthcare heroes and those public health, safety, and human services workers around them. While these grants demonstrate our support for those on the front lines, I want to remind everyone the best way to support these workers is to continue to slow the spread of this virus. Our numbers continue to look good in Vermont, but we must stay vigilant to keep it that way. Because as I've said before, we need to continue fighting this virus until a vaccine has been developed and distributed, which is in all reality several months away. So it's up to each of us to protect the gains we've made. It only takes a few stem simple steps to make a difference. Keep at least six feet apart whenever possible. Wear a mask in public places. Wash your hands a lot and stay home when sick. Taking personal responsibility is the best way to keep this in check. Protect our health care system, save lives, and win the war against this invisible enemy. Thank you again for all your help in this fight, and I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith to provide more details on the hazard pay program. Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. The Agency of Human Services is pleased to announce that the online application for the Frontline Employees Hazardous Pay Grant Program is now open. Opened at 9 a.m. this morning, and as of 9.15, we've had, we have 130 applications in pro progress. As the Governor mentioned, this is a first-come, first-serve uh, program, so those that are eligible, we urge to apply as quick as possible. The program was established by Act 136 of the 2020 legislature to pay eligible employees who work during the COVID-19 public health emergency from March 13th to May 15th of uh, this year. A total of $28 million was appropriated to the Agency of Human Services to provide the grants which will be available, like I said, on a first come, first serve basis. The application is for covered employers to apply for the program and then pass the amounts on to their eligible employees who work for them during the defined period. There's been a lot of public discussion uh, about hazardous pay for employees during the COVID-19 pandemic. While there have been many employees throughout the state of Vermont who did amazing work uh, during this crisis. This program is for specific employers and employees as defined by the authorizing legislation. As you may recall, previous discussions about hazardous pay included references to other employees, including grocery store workers, cleaning or janitorial uh, services, and trash collectors. However, as outlined uh, in the authorizing legislation, this program is focused on public health, human services, and public safety employers who were open and operating during the emergency response period. So what types of employers should apply to this program? We encourage all employers in the public health, human services, and public safety fields to visit our website to learn if they are a covered employer. Specifically, the legislation defines the following types of employers as eligible to apply. Assisted living residences, nursing homes, residential care homes, therapeutic community residents, health care facilities or physician's offices, a dentist's office or dental facility, a homeless shelter, a home health agency, Thera uh, therapy provider uh, contracted by a home health agency or nursing home, federal qualified health center, uh, rural health centers, rural health clinics or clinics for the uninsured, residential treatment program licensed by the Department of Children and Families, ambulance service or first rep uh, responder service, morgues, uh, provider of necessary and, uh, and services to vulnerable or disadvantaged populations. Once a, an employer determines they meet the requirements and should apply, they will then need to determine which of their employees are eligible to receive the pay. 
eligible employees must have been working in a job with an elevated risk of exposure during COVID-19 during the emergency period. This job must have been in person and not done through telework. Except for home health ag uh, agencies and nursing homes which have no cap, eligible employees are those who earn a base hourly wage of 24, uh, excuse me, $25 or less. Eligible employees who work at least 216 hours in jobs with an elevated risk of exposure to COVID-19 are eligible to receive $2,000 in hazard, hazard pay. Those eligible employees who worked at least 68 hours but less than 216 hours are eligible to receive $1,200 in hazard pay. We are encouraging employers to apply to make sure these critically imp uh, important employees receive recognition and the compensation to reflect the work they did keeping Vermonters safe during the crisis. You can find a link uh, to the online application on the Agency of Human Services website, and the governor had mentioned it, I'll just repeat it one more time, human services, one word, dot Vermont, dot gov. Human services, dot Vermont, dot gov. With that, I'd like to turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Levine for an update. Hi, I'll begin with a quick update on our current data. I didn't really bring any slides today because um, there have been minimal new cases over the course of the last number of days, five cases or less. Our website, as of last night, reflects 1,427 total cases, one person hospitalized, no change in the 57 deaths. There's really no substantial changes in any of the epidemiologic metrics that we follow on a daily basis. It's noteworthy that in less than two weeks, we will have tested 100,000 people since the onset of the pandemic. Many of the outbreaks, and I should say most of the outbreaks, that the public health team has been following are winding down with the newest one being the inmates that have returned from Mississippi. Knock on wood, we are not seeing a lot of new outbreaks in the state of Vermont at this time. I did want to address uh, a new piece of literature that's come out that uh, many Vermonters are commenting on, writers are writing about, and uh, frankly, there are emails flooding my inbox. It'd be an understatement to say that school reopening continues to be a topic of major interest. I'm not going to repeat today all of the reasons that the medical and the public health community believe it's the right time for Vermont to reopen its schools, since we've sent, spent so many press conferences discussing that issue and even bringing guests to the podium frequently. But I would like to discuss the fact that information in this pandemic continues to evolve quite rapidly, and that includes the medical literature, and publication turnaround times can be briefer than ever before in recognition of the need to get information out as quickly as possible. But keep in mind, scientific information must be vetted appropriately, and one cannot just cherry pick studies to fit the occasion or favor a point of view. There was a research letter published in JAMA Pediatrics last week that is the focus of many people's attention. Now recall that previously we have stated repetitively the wealth of literature showing children are less likely to get infected, less likely to have severe illness, and less likely to transmit virus to others. In this very brief research report in the form of a letter, the investigators suggest that children under the age of five with mild to moderate symptoms of COVID-19 had high amounts of the viral RNA, the nucleic acid, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in their nose compared with older children and adults. 
in a sample of 145 patients distributed amongst young, older children and adults. We don't know a lot about these patients in terms of race, sex, duration of symptoms, how many were minimally symptomatic, or any underlying conditions. The investigators use this term cyclic threshold, or CT value, which we've discussed here previously, but it's an indicator for the amount of virus present. What does this mean? This looks at the amount of RNA, not live virus itself. And we don't know if the virus that they detected is actually virus that could infect someone. So it's hard to know what to conclude from this study. Certainly one can conclude that children can become infected with the virus, which we've known, and that they might possibly spread the virus if they harbor a lot of it. But we have to balance that consideration with the fact that observational studies worldwide, discussed here previously, indicate children don't spread the virus very efficiently. I caution everyone that this report is very preliminary. It needs to be further replicated in the scientific community, and it cannot by itself lead us to premature conclusions or to reversing our prior conclusions. And I would again reiterate two things. The time is right for Vermont to reopen its schools, taking note of the numbers of new cases we see and the positivity rate of our testing. And secondly, schools are a microcosm of our communities. So teachers and parents and staff all reflect that community and through their behaviors in general. So in general, adhering to the same guidance that we always give and the governor just provided can impact the environment that our children find themselves in and make it the truly favorable environment that our communities are reflecting now. I'll pass it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, before we turn it over to questions, uh, as if we didn't have enough on our plate, and we do have another uh, a tropical storm heading our way, um, Isaias. And uh, so I thought I'd have Commissioner Sherling give us an update on what we might expect. Commissioner Sherling. Good morning, Governor. Uh, opportunity for a brief update from the Emergency Operations Center, who's in close contact with the National Weather Service tracking that tropical storm as it moves toward our area, anticipated to arrive this afternoon and last through early tomorrow morning. Uh, the storm is tracked further west than originally anticipated, which will bring increased rainfall uh, in the area of the Champlain Valley and over at uh, New York. It's moving pretty swiftly. Uh, we anticipate as a result of that westward track that there'll be an increase in uh, uh, wind component to southern Vermont, eastern Vermont, in particular in Bennington, Wyndham County is based on the current track. There's a flash flood watch in effect and a high wind warning in effect. Uh, among the most important messages for Vermonters is to keep an eye on streams and rivers, especially if you're in a low-lying area. Don't traverse water. Uh, be cautious around dirt roads and culverts. Uh, relative to the wind, ensure that you take in any items that uh, that may be uh, moved around uh, by wind gusts that may uh, come up into the 50 mile an hour range. Uh, in terms of preparation, the Emergency Operations Center will be active with a number of assets beginning uh, late this afternoon. Uh, we're in close coordination with our urban search and rescue and swift water teams and in close contact with local emergency managers around Vermont. Uh, and updates will be uh, sent out as more information on the con conditions continue to evolve. Thank you, Commissioner Sherling. We'll now open up to questions. All right, we'll start with Calvin. All right, thank you, Governor. So um, I guess I just start off, what is your message to um, frontline workers in grocery stores and gas stations that feel that they uh, are entitled to this money as well? Um, especially also how we never really saw a big jump in COVID cases in our hospital, yet frontline grocery store workers interact with thousands of people with it. 
Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate here in Vermont. Uh, obviously, the steps we took um, were uh, conducive to uh, a low positivity rate and low, uh, in, you know, number of cases uh, that we've seen, and we enjoy that at this point in time. Um, we um, th there was a proposal in the legislature uh, to do just that and include a number of different areas, different sectors uh, for hazard pay. Uh, unfortunately, the um, the guidelines that we received uh, through the CARES Act wouldn't allow for that. Uh, it's only for healthcare workers. So it prevented us from uh, utilizing uh, that funding source to do that. So again, we're very uh, fortunate. Uh, we're thankful uh, for them uh, going to work every day uh, in those conditions. Uh, those uh, on the front lines, they were on the front lines as well in the grocery stores and otherwise, and, uh, and, and we see that uh, throughout Vermont as many thousands of people have gone back to work uh, in different, different areas. But again, uh, they're putting themselves at risk, and, but I will say uh, that they've been uh, paying attention. You know, wearing a mask uh, has been, uh, been a high compliance of wearing a mask even before it was mandatory. Uh, staying six feet apart, staying home with six, keeping keeping apart whenever you can, at least at six feet, uh, and don't get into uh, into situations uh, where you could uh, contract the disease. So um, again, we thank them for their efforts. Uh, it just wasn't allowable under the conditions of the uh, the Federal CARES Act. And just a quick follow-up to why even offer hazard pay uh, if, if these frontline medical workers, they never stop working. They've been receiving checks all along, uh, but yet we still have thousands of Vermonters who are unemployed and recently just lost a $600 federal benefit. So why, why not? Give some of this money to them. Yeah. Uh, well, again, this was a, uh, a legislative proposal um, that they had initiated to begin with. Uh, it went from, I think it was somewhere around 80 million, as I remember, uh, to begin with, um, and then uh, pared down from there. So, uh, and then went down as low as 20 million after some of the guidelines were put into place. Uh, but that's, that might be a better question for the legislature. Ross? Thank you, Governor. Um, my question is regarding the uh, uh, new outbreak of cases uh, at Core Civic down in Mississippi. I I'm curious if you feel that enough was done to prevent uh, outbreaks in that facility, and if you can maybe speak to what the state's doing now to make sure that more is being done to address the situation that's unfolding down there. Yeah, obviously uh, not enough um, because uh, we it's a major outbreak in that facility. Um, Mississippi uh, is. Uh, experiencing uh, a high a number of cases um, and and so uh, they're right in that Sun Belt uh, along with many other states in that region um, in hindsight you know I should have uh, seen this coming in some respects but we were relying on core civic uh, to do the testing uh, and they were testing with uh, symptomatic uh, cases and not uh, and not throughout now, we, uh, we took a different course. We had our outbreak here in Vermont, uh, and so we took a different, uh, different approach, different track, and, uh, and uh, implemented a testing program here. Um, but uh, with our uh, contractual relationship, uh, they had assured us uh, that they were taking care of things there, um, but again, uh, not to the Vermont standards that we're experiencing now. So, We've, uh, we've implemented, uh, I'm going to ask Secretary Smith to elaborate on this uh, because it's important for people to understand uh, the steps we've taken since then. Uh, but, uh, but again, in, in hindsight, we should have, uh, we should have seen this coming. Thanks for the uh, question. Just so everybody knows, Core, uh, Core Civic is a private company that houses about 219 uh, Vermont inmates in Mississippi, primarily because we don't have the uh, space for them here in our Vermont facilities. Uh, Core Civic has been following uh, the Mississippi State Health Guidelines for testing by only testing, as the governor had mentioned, only symptomatic individuals, just to compare the Vermont Department of Corrections regularly tests all staff and inmates, those with uh, or without symptoms. They also test every single new intake to the system on days 0, 7, and 12. 
the uh, core civic Mississippi protocols may work in sort of a low virus spread environment. But as you can, as you all know, Mississippi has seen much greater a virus spread in recent weeks and tactics needed to change and the core uh, civic protocols needed to simulate Vermont's. The uptick uh, to, in more, uh, to more enhanced uh, procedures was slow to contain that outbreak. Um, we are now insisting uh, that Vermont protocols be put in place by core civic in Mississippi. Those include testing the entire population and not just those showing signs of the virus. Um, and that includes regular testing of the population in a rotating basis like we do here in Vermont. In Vermont, we have a rotating basis where we test one facility a week. Um, we want Core, uh, Core Civic to be in that rotation so that um, you know, once every, it would be five or six weeks, we would be testing that whole facility. We, I, we want a procedure and that has been started now. Uh, we've, where, where, they're test, where they tested the entire population. We don't have all the results back yet. Um, we want them to isolate those that test positive from those that test uh, negative. That has begun. Uh, we want them to test correctional officers and staff in the Vermont section of the prison. My understanding is that has begun. Uh, we want periodic testing of negative population per the Vermont schedule, as I had mentioned. We want um, regular entire population-wide testing, like I had mentioned. And plus, we want the essentials of medic, uh, medical care, sanitation, and other uh, particulars of the Vermont uh, model uh, instituted. Um, th that said, I just want to caution for here for Vermont or in, um, in any other facility that we may have. Um, this is a worldwide pandemic that's re wreaked havoc in the Northeast and before turning uh, to the South and West. Um, without a vaccine, we're going to see occasional outbreaks. Um, the goal is to minimize the impact of the outbreaks when they occur. In Mississippi, that didn't happen uh, in, in the core civic uh, prison. So uh, as the governor said, I think um, the contractor was slow to implement the Vermont protocols to contain the outbreak, especially in light of the spread of the virus in Mississippi. And we needed to be better uh, on top of that um, as, uh, as the Mississippi situation uh, changed. You know, we have approximately 1,400 inmates in our custody today. Uh, of those, approximately 1,200 or 86% are under the more strict uh, Vermont protocol. And Mississippi, with its 200, approximately 219 Vermont inmates, or approximately 14% of all inmates, um, they need to come under the Vermont protocols. And, and we need to, right now, we need to really focus our attention on this outbreak and contain it and dissect what we need to do better as we go forward. So um, is that enough update? The district, has the state sent any resources down to help them keep up their testing capacity? Because I know that that was a concern of theirs. That yeah. They didn't have we're, we're, we're looking, we've done the initial tests um, and then we're going to do the protocol testing, the seven, the 13 days. Um, so far we have not heard of any sort of restrictions on test supplies uh, and we're working on labs now to get quicker turnaround than what we're getting um, right here with the initial. So uh, we'll continue. Uh, as you know, uh, Vermont has a very robust uh, testing program. Uh, other states um, may or may not. Um, other um, private entities may or may not, but we're going to institute a, a fairly robust uh, testing program in that facility. Actually, if you want to stay, Mike. Okay. <laughs> um, they're several uh, thousand miles away from this facility to here in the state. And uh, oversight-wise, how are we sure that this is actually being done and you're not just getting a paper trail? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, Steve. Um, obviously, we have um, uh, people on the phone every day with them. 
Uh, those uh, meetings have been uh, almost 24-7 now, um, making sure that we stay on top of what's going that uh, on down there. We may put boots on the ground there. Um, I, you know, that's an option that we may have to do if we feel that it's necessary. I think where our concentration right now is making sure the medical resources are what needs to be uh, really implemented as, as we move down um, the road here. So we're looking at all options uh, in terms of what we're going on. But the first option right now is making sure that we get people segregated that are positive and negative, make sure we continue to test the negative uh, people to keep monitoring, make sure the guards are tested uh, as we're moving forward. And I guess um, as a final follow-up, uh, this kind of points out what many critics have said that uh, you know, this is a business for those folks, um, and it's treated differently, say, from how we do the things here in the state uh, with our state facilities. Is it time now to start looking hard at uh, perhaps building an in-state facility? I think, as the governor mentioned, um, Tuesday. Where, what day are we? Um, last Friday. Um, it's been a it's been a long weekend, but. Um, um, as the governor mentioned on Friday, um, you know, this administration has proposed a new facility. And I think it's high time that we start thinking about that so that we don't have to rely on out-of-state facilities. This state has relied on out-of-state facilities for a long, long time. And maybe this is the call where we start building facilities where we can house Vermont prisoners in one. Because if you look at Vermont, I mean, our, I want to put this in context. Our testing, our tracing, our quarantine, our sanitation programs in our Vermont-based correctional facilities are some of the best in the country right now. And, 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 and actually, we've had some inquiries from international people about our protocols. Um, we have um, coronavirus protocols that are more robust and comprehensive than most, if not every state in the union. So um, to answer your question, yes, I'd like to see a facility here in Vermont. Um, as AHS secretary, I would like to see that so that we can make sure there's uniformity among all our prisoners in terms of the robustness of a program that we have. All right, moving to the phone, we'll start with Mike Donahue, the Islander. If I could just before Mike uh, asks his question, I just would like to say, you know, we did make this proposal uh, to the legislature uh, to build a new facility, and, and it was not uh, well received uh, by them or many others uh, throughout the state. So I do think it's time for us to revisit that, and uh, and because we, we know our uh, facilities, our infrastructure is outdated and needs to be upgraded, and we need to bring our uh, offenders back to Vermont and have them under one roof. We are the gold standard. I, uh, I would say, in speaking with other governors, I don't know of any, uh, many others, if any, who have uh, come forward to, to tell us uh, about their experience, what they're doing in their uh, prison populations uh, that is even close uh, to what we're doing here in Vermont. All right, Mike. Thank you, thank you, Governor. Uh, and thanks, because that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you about the uh, facility. But, uh, but since the uh, mandatory mask order, there are still people going into hardware stores, convenience stores without masks. And we're hearing uh, some towns still have not seen those the facial safety masks uh, that uh, the state was sending out last Friday. Just wondering when might all the towns actually see these masks uh, so they can distribute them to their people? I know there were 200,000 uh, that were going out uh, in different ways, whether it was through um, some of the uh, um, community action centers, uh, whether it was a few food distribution sites, uh, whether it was through the towns and so forth. So it's going to take a little time uh, to get them out. Um, I, again, I would say uh, we're not unique uh, in, in talking with other governors. Uh, throughout the country who have mandatory uh, masks as well as we do, uh, they're experiencing the same thing, uh, that they, uh, 
uh, they can't get compliance to that last whatever percent regardless of uh, the enforcement measures that they put into place. Um, it just hasn't helped. Uh, so um, there, there, there's a certain a sector uh, that is uh, resistant to this. Uh, I get it, but, um, but if they really want to help and want to do their part, um, they should, uh, they should uh, put a mask on. It's an easy thing to do to help others. Um, but we're working, at, we're, we're working at trying to uh, distribute the, the mass. I know that there's been, even in some of the businesses I've seen uh, where or heard where they've had mass uh, there uh, given to their patrons. Uh, they may charge for them or they may just give them to them. Um, but I would advocate uh, anywhere we can uh, to, to help one another out. And if it's a, a business uh, maybe they would consider uh, providing the mass or or at least uh, uh, having them available for someone to purchase. Well, okay. I, my understanding last week was that a lot of the fire department's rescue squads were going to be the primary point to, on a lot of these. That's sort of their bailiwick of health and safety. So, uh, but these fire departments are not, they haven't seen them yet. So yeah, I, I, I don't. I thought it was. I, I'll get that, uh, for, you know, to to determine uh, how that was being, uh, how they were being delivered. But it was my understanding that uh, fire departments were one segment of that. Uh, that there were a number of other uh, ways to get those out. But uh, let me get that for you, or so that we can get it, and make sure that we're accurate on that. Sure. <clears throat> and last thing, what is the. Uh, to the program, who's paying for it, and what is the accountability for this program to actually see whether 200,000 masks are actually going somewhere or whether they're sitting on a shelf uh, at a uh, community action place or in a fire station or whatever. Yeah, you mean the accountability part? Um, these were all donated, yeah. uh, donated masks uh, to the state uh, that I'm aware of, a cloth masks. And, uh, and hopefully uh, that the community action centers, the fire departments, the food centers and so forth, uh, will see again uh, the need to get these out. If they have extra masks, they're not able to distribute them. Um, we, uh, we'd like to know that so that we can get them to the areas of need. Uh, so we'll have to pay attention to that, but I'm not sure about the accountability uh, part either and whether who's keeping track of that. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, are you aware of anything while well, I've got you on? Uh, yes, Governor. Uh, the communication went out uh, via the Emergency Operations Center to municipalities and first responders uh, late last week at the same time it was announced at the press conference. So we're now taking in the request for masks. Uh, they're not going to be randomly distributed. They're going to go into places that are requesting them. So uh, the plan uh, is for next week for those to be uh, delivered to the municipalities and first responders that have requested them. Uh, in terms of accountability, uh, we can ask for uh, an account of how many have been uh, distributed uh, to the folks that receive them after next week. So, Commissioner Sherling, if, so, if somebody wanted to reach out, a fire department wanted to uh, obtain some of these masks, they would go to the SEOC? Correct. There, uh, there is an online form, I believe, uh, but for first responders and municipalities, they all have a point of contact through the SEOC so they can contact uh, the on duty SDOC folks as well. Great. Thank you both very much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you, Mike. Lisa, the AP. Lisa Rocky, AP. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? We can. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, this is a question for Secretary Smith. Um, has the Corrections Department, Department gotten back the results of those, uh, those pending tests from the inmates in, in uh, Mississippi? Yeah, I th I'll let him answer that. But uh, I know uh, as of this morning, we had not received those back yet. They went to a, another uh, commercial lab in, I believe, Michigan. Um, whereas the initial uh, batch went to the state lab in uh, Mississippi and they were uh, good enough to do those, run those tests for us. But as we're seeing across the country, that seems to be problematic in some of the commercial labs 
uh, the slow response time. Uh, some are saying, you know, seven to 14 days. Uh, I heard, I was on a call with the National Governors Association yesterday, and that was the common complaint, was the slow response time with the commercial lab. So I think that's the case, but I'll let Secretary Smith answer further. Lisa, we're hoping that we're going to have uh, lab results today, but as of yet, I don't have a number on the remaining labs that we're waiting on. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of the day, we will. Um, we're just as anxious as you are to um, get those numbers. Okay, and um, when does Vermont change its testing protocol for inmates, and what exactly is the protocol, and then when? And then why didn't the state require Mississippi to do that at that time, knowing that Mississippi was only testing for asymptomatic, or symptomatic inmates, sorry. Right. Yeah, and if you remember uh, before Northwest uh, hit, we were only testing for symptomatic as well. Right. Um, that was our protocols. We changed it right after Northwest and went into a higher level of uh, of uh, uh, testing requirement and a robust requirement uh, for that. At the time, uh, symptomatic testing is, the, and still is, by the way, is sort of what is recommended in Mississippi through the health department, from what I, what I understand, and had been adopted by Core Civic. Um, as, the, as I said in my remarks, as soon as the virus started to change it in a low virus em environment, that's probably okay. It's not our protocol, but it's, it probably catches uh, uh, the, the symptomatic cases that you want in a high virus sort of environment. Um, in, and even in a low virus environment, you just want to make sure. Um, and uh, where we test everyone on a periodic basis, that did not transfer to Core Civic. It should have. It should have. Um, the protocol should have been in place like the Vermont protocols. So in April, we changed our protocols. Uh, Core Civic is changing their protocols now. It should have happened sooner. So what is, what is our protocol now? Our, well, there's several. There, there's, um, it, every week or thereabouts, we test an entire facility. Um, so yesterday we tested Northwest, um, the facility. Next week it will be another facility. We'll include the Core Civic uh, facility into that rotation as well. So every week we test a, a, a facility, the entire facility. Um, that's one protocol. Um, if we have symptomatic patients, uh, excuse me, inmates, um, excuse me, if we have intakes, any intakes, you come into our facility, you are tested at zero, seven, and 12 days. You are quarantined. That is an important aspect of keeping the virus out of the facilities. If you test uh, positive, you are, you are quarantined. Uh, that's part of our protocol as we move forward. There's also a whole set of protocols if we have a major outbreak in terms of sanitation and quarantine units that we can stand up. And frankly, we have those units now in anticipation that we will have positives that come into our system. So that's our protocol. Okay, thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Um, I think this question is probably going to be for Dr. Levine, so you probably have to hook here. Okay. Uh, I've got a question about testing, and I reached out to Bennett Truman and was unable to get really much of an answer uh, as of, of yet. So um, I had a reader reach out um, who was showing signs of COVID, sore throat, fever, body ache. Um, this person doesn't have a primary care provider, doesn't have health insurance, called 211. 211 referred them to Notch, which is the, the local uh, provider here for federally provided health care. Um, and, and they wanted, uh, they required this person to be set up as a patient 
which requires out-of-pocket costs uh, in order to just get a referral to go get tested. Um, so this reader, I guess, long story short, they, they want to know, um, is there a way that people can get tested that are showing symptoms that don't have a primary care doctor, don't have health insurance, but would really like to do the right thing and, and get tested and get contact tracing underway if, if that's indeed uh, a positive test. Hi, this is Dr. Levine. <clears throat> so the key part of the question is the fact that this was a symptomatic patient. So like anyone with symptoms of anything, we like people to be connected with the healthcare system if they're going to get a test. And rather than then decide themselves what their diagnosis is and what the appropriate workup is, they should be connected with the healthcare system. So without commenting further on the federally qualified health center, you know, they were trying to engage this person, it sounds like, in healthcare, which I think is really important uh, to be sure that the disposition worked out the way it needed to. Um, obviously, most people who are presenting with symptoms want to be on the fast track to getting the test and getting a result so that they know what they have and what they should be uh, provided with guidance on to do. So that is the way this should evolve in that setting. Um, and, and that's why we have it arranged that way. Um, that's about really all I can say, that, that that was the appropriate thing. And they made the right phone calls ahead of time to try to get further connected, and they actually got connected with the right health care provider. Uh, it sounds like they just didn't want to follow through on the actual pathway that the provider wanted them to go through. Well, it's my understanding that the provider actually said that they didn't even have an appointment to become a, a patient for like the next four or five days anyway. Um, but it, it, it just seems a little strange, you know, we you touted earlier in your introduction that we've, we've processed 100,000 samples. Um, but if, if these samples aren't going out, aren't being conducted on maybe the right people, you can do a, uh, a million tests. And, and if you're not testing the right people, it, it I would think is not really that productive. Um, and you had mentioned, uh, to a question probably two months ago about the cost. I, I asked about um, would it cost anyone, anything for anyone to get tested that needs to be tested? And, and you were pretty clear that there will be no cost. We want everybody tested, especially people that are showing symptoms. But the person I talked to is really, you know, they're, they're in a position where they, they can't pay um, a, a fee for a, for a doctor at this point in their life. And they're having to make the choice of, do I continue, you know, without a test in my life or, um, you know, or, or try to go get an asymptomatic test, but my understanding is that that's booked out for a couple weeks. Um, this person is frustrated because they're trying to do the right thing and get tested um, but it, 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 there are a lot of obstacles to, to doing that. Yeah, I, under, I understand that in this case. Um, but again, the reality is uh, the person did not feel well and they needed health care. And part of the health care was a test, possibly. But the other part was actually getting health care. So I um, can't really say much more than that. You know, um, we, we do prefer for a symptomatic person to not go through one of the uh, pop-ups um, because of the fact that they are symptomatic um, and we need to know that ahead of time and make special arrangements with them so that they're not at risk of infecting anybody else. Um, and so the healthcare system is designed for just this type of person, but they need to follow through appropriately. So is it safe to say that uh, what was mentioned two months ago, that, that if you want to get tested, it won't cost you anything, is, is really not totally true, that that if you are showing symptoms and you want to get tested, it, it is actually going to cost you 
uh, something, especially if you're, you don't have insurance? It will not cost you for the test. That, that is all we mentioned, is that testing is not going to be charged to the patient. But, but if, if somebody's uninsured and they're showing symptoms, they have to go through a doctor, so they have we, to we have, you know, We have a lot of resources for people who are uninsured as well uh, in the state. And there are clinics that um, have been existing for many years that uh, specifically their role is to provide care for those who are either underinsured or uninsured, and they do a great job of that. So there are, there are other outlets, Steve, is all I can tell you. All right, we're going to move to Well, our... I'll, I'll let you move on. It sounds like this person isn't going to be able to get tested. Hey, Greg, this is Mike Smith. If that person feels comfortable, would they uh, contact uh, my office um, and we'll, um, we'll, tr we'll try to sort through what, what's going on here? How's that sound? Sure. Thank you, Mike. Sean, Chester Telegraph. Thanks. This is a question for uh, Secretary French. There's a, the many schools uh, won't be able to bring teachers in for planning and training in the week before the September 8th university that was ordered by the Governor Scott because they won't have enough days in their contracts to make it through the 175-day year. We, we understand the AOE has asked the legislature for a five-day reduction, but they're not going to meet until later in August, and there may not be a lot of time for any kind of certainty for the districts to work with. Would it be possible for a school district to petition the State Board of Education for a waiver of days under the unanticipated closing clause of the statute, or does the SBE have the power to just do it unilaterally at its August 19th meeting? Uh, thanks, Sean. That's a fairly complex question, I think. Um, you know, just firstly, uh, we have not put any specific proposal before the legislature yet uh, regarding the calendar. Um, we have expressed an interest in uh, working with them uh, to address some issues. But at least we do think the calendar is something, you know, just that the statute is to allude to, it's something uh, that probably needs to be addressed uh, going forward in a very uncertain semester. Um, to your question about the waiver, though, um, I'm not sure. Uh, the current regulation would allow a waiver at this moment in time. I think our you know, language in that regulation, like so much of our regulation, never anticipated pandemic can really speak to uh, essentially snow days or some other unanticipated emergency that happens in the first half of the year, and then leaving a district very limited option in the second half of the year to uh, address the issues. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not fully convinced that the state board would have authority under its current regulation to deal with the issue. Uh, but it's something certainly, again, that uh, we're interested in working on. I would say, um, in the messaging of the school districts, I said, you know, you should, as much as possible, try to anticipate repurposing some of your in-service days towards the front of the year if you can, um, with the understanding that uh, there will be, I think, a fairly broad interest in addressing the calendar issues in the legislature uh, going forward. But that doesn't really that school districts very much, uh, very much time to plan that. Um, it, it kind of leaves them sort of sitting there waiting until the very last minute. It, would you expect the legislature to be able to get that done before the, the, the five days before the September 8th uh, opening? Yeah, as I said, I haven't put, uh, we haven't put forward any specific proposal to legislature. I've had sort of informal conversations with them. Uh, so it's hard for me to, uh, to guess at this point as to what extent how quickly they move on the issue. I will say districts are working uh, really hard on these plans now, so I don't necessarily believe um, you know, that that beginning part is really the um, sort of ultimately necessary to determine their plans. I would agree it's really important to have that time to practice uh, implementing some of what's in their plans and to get back in the facilities. Um, but it's hard at this point to predict, I think, you know, what the legislature would do. But once again, I think districts do have some flexibility uh, in their current uh, calendars to redeploy days towards the front of the year if they chose to do so. Hey, thank you very much. Hey, uh, while we're, I want to go back to the question from Greg. Uh, Greg, if you're uh, still on, if you could have uh, the person you were talking about contact our office, 828-3333. Uh, we'll make sure they get a test without any out-of-pocket costs. You can pass that 
Colin VT Digger. Hi. Uh, good morning, almost afternoon. Um, I had a few questions for Governor Scott about uh, the prison. I know it's been, or the outbreak in Mississippi, I know it's been touched on a number of times, but I still had a few questions. Um, when your administration signed a contract with Court Civic, uh, it was coming in the wake of uh, Camp Hill and some frustration there, uh, and having to follow Pennsylvania's rules. And explicitly, uh, it said that Court Civic would be a different situation and that uh, Vermont could include adherence to our own laws, rules, and policies as part of the agreement. Um, so I'm wondering why Court Civic did not automatically follow Vermont's policies or why Vermont did not, did not request that Court Civic follow its policies around that testing. Yeah, well, again, uh, this was of late or in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, we should have uh, adhered to that and uh, made sure that they did this. It's, it's tough to convince. Uh, another state that uh, they're not uh, doing things uh, to our standard uh, in terms of, uh, of the protocol, not just with the correctional facilities, but others as well. Uh, and so uh, it's much easier after the fact, obviously, uh, for them to see uh, the need and, uh, and to see um, the viability in, in doing it the way we had, uh, had uh, approached this. So again, uh, looking back, we should have, uh, we should have pressed harder on them to do this, but um, it was just a, a shortcoming on our part. Can you clarify when uh, Vermont first made a request to have Court Civic follow the Colin, state testing I, protocol? I, I don't know, um, Colin. Uh, we can find out, but I, I just don't know. I don't know if there was a formal request made. I, ju I just don't know, have that information. I heard Secretary Smith say earlier that the contractor was, quote, slow to implement the Vermont protocols to contain the outbreak. And if indeed Vermont did not ask them to follow those protocols, is it fair to say that they were slow? Secretary Smith. Colin, you answered your own question when you said uh, the contractor shall follow all Vermont rules, regulations, those sort of things. Um, and that clearly didn't happen in this case. When they were contacted in terms of protocols, I don't have a date on that. Um, we'll get to Commissioner Baker to get back to you on that in terms of slow, but slow to me means that we, they weren't following what we were following. And I also, if you, if you um, follow along with me, I said as the contractor was slow to implement, the Vermont proto uh, protocols, uh, the outbreak, and especially as the spread of the virus in Mississippi started to accelerate, we needed to do a better job to stay on top of that, and we did not, and that's what the governor is talking about. And would your expectation, Secretary Smith, be that Core Civic um, keeps an eye on every state and uh, government body that it has a contract with and make sure to proactively change its own laws as opposed to acting on requests from those people on the other side of the contract? I think it's both, to be honest with you. I, I think, I, and I, I think I'm acknowledging that it's both. If you're a contractor and you, you have a contract that says you're going to abide by the rules, regulations of that certain entity, then yeah, I do expect that. Uh, at the same time, I also spec, expect the Department of Corrections to make sure they are following those rules. Um, Governor Scott, on May 8th, uh, there was news out of Arizona, 400 prisoners tested positive at a core civic facility in Arizona. On May 16th, uh, 1,300 out of 2,500 inmates at a core civic facility in Tennessee tested positive. Uh, why didn't your administration see this coming? And what does accountability look like uh, in terms of that, um, who should have seen it sooner? Who should have acted? Uh, and what are the consequences for the failure to do that? Yeah, Colin, I think uh, we, I think I've admitted uh, two or three times already. Uh, Secretary Smith did as well uh, that we should have pushed forward on this. Should have seen this coming. I don't know how to be any more clear than that. I wasn't aware of the dates. I didn't happen to read it in any of your stories on uh, Vermont Digger, um, but uh, but if I but if you did, I missed it. Um, so. Um, I wasn't aware that they had the outbreaks in Arizona or Tennessee. 
uh, in those facilities. But I do know uh, that, uh, that most of the other states have not adhered to the same standard that we have in terms of our prison population. Uh, we learned the hard way uh, when we had the first outbreak of, I think it was 38 uh, offenders, and then we took steps uh, to, to rectify that. Uh, and it's not just testing the offender population. Obviously, there has to be a port of entry. There has to be an intake. Um, so you have to test staff members as well. So it gets a little bit more complicated uh, than just testing the offender population. We had assumed uh, their protocols were working. Uh, there weren't any cases being reported uh, to us uh, of any outbreak or any uh, positive cases in uh, Mississippi. So we assumed uh, that what they were doing was working for them. But obviously when the six came uh, to Vermont and we tested them as per our protocol for new intakes coming into the state, we found there was a problem and then we went further. Again, should we have seen it sooner? Um, we, we should have, uh, shortcoming on our part, admittedly. Um, but, uh, but at this point, I think uh, the main goal is to get back on the right track and, and I think uh, other uh, offender population po uh, prisons uh, should uh, take notice uh, that this is happening and, uh, and they need to do a better job, maybe do it the, the Vermont way. Uh, Secretary Smith, thanks for your time. And uh, Secretary Smith, if you could have uh, folks follow up with details about when Vermont requested uh, these protocols, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you, Colin. Steve, NEK TV. Um, hello, can you hear me? Ken. Uh, thank you. Uh, one for the uh, doctor and uh, uh, one for the governor, if I may. Um, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, I had this question from a viewer, and bear with me, because he walked me through this, and it, it, it's, it's different. Okay, the coronavirus is a family of seven types of uh, coronaviruses with uh, SARS-CoV-2 being the virus responsible for COVID-19. And um, there are seven different, the seven different viruses are ID. And, um, you know, there's SARS, uh, CoV-2, MERS, uh, 2290, and goes on and on and on. And then we have the flu shots for uh, Brisbane, Kansas, Colorado, Phuket, etc. I guess basically what this person was asking me is the tests that we're testing, are they specifically for COVID-19 or do they include um, any of the six other uh, types of coronaviruses? Yeah, that, that question actually isn't that complicated, Steve. So the only thing in your list of coronaviruses that you didn't mention is that there are many benign, non-pandemic causing coronaviruses that all of us in this country have been in contact with since we grew up. So sure. the phenomenon you're referring to is cross-reactivity of an assay. So it would react and say the test is positive and you would wonder, is it truly positive against SARS-CoV-2 or is it picking up another coronavirus in the same family? So when these things go through um, their um, validation testing, uh, they carefully look at this whole phenomenon of cross-reactivity. And that's where the, the term specificity comes in of the test, because a very specific test is only going to be positive for this particular coronavirus and it's not going to be a false positive making you think the person has COVID-19 but they actually are infected with another coronavirus. So the higher the specificity the more likelihood that the test is not mistaking another coronavirus for the SARS-CoV-2. So we feel pretty comfortable that the majority of tests are actually detecting SARS-CoV-2, which is the cause of COVID-19. Uh, great, thank you. <laughs> I, I hope that clears that up for uh, for this person. Uh, thanks a lot. And Governor, 
Uh, you mentioned that uh, you'd considered uh, uh, building a, a new prison here in Vermont, but you're getting a lot of pushback from the legislature. Uh, did I hear that correctly? Yes. Yeah, that was, um, I think, two years ago we made the proposal, and it was rejected. Okay. Would, would a new facility, like, cancel out any of the existing facilities, or would it be in addition to no, the uh, it, facilities it, we have? It would be a replacement of uh, some of the f uh, facilities. We had proposed a more of a campus-type uh, approach, uh, much, uh, much larger than some of the ones we've had. Uh, to bring them up to up to standard i see and um is this a philosophical problem i mean do we uh, do aren't the percentage of uh of the prison populations for drugs something like uh about 50 percent uh being drug offenses i i don't have that in front of me but i don't believe that to be the case but we can get that for so, you Sure, thanks. Uh, so, because I, 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 I was thinking that the way the legislature was uh, was thinking that jail should only be for violent offenders and um, that the, we'd have to eventually phase out or treat uh, yeah. the I, drug I offenders. Yeah, I don't think it had anything to do with the, the population or the size because we had advocated we need to update the facilities so we could build it any size, we could put it in any location. Uh, we, we were uh, uh, flexible in terms of, of how we do this, um, so it, was, um, it wasn't based on the population and the offenses. I see. So it's more, more, more for modernization? Um, from our standpoint, yes, to update the facilities. Okay. I mean, if you've been through some of them, we ended up closing uh, one in Windsor appropriately. Uh, and uh, and we have some challenges in some of the other locations as well. Now, fortunately, I've never been through any, and uh, I hope not to have to. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you both very much. Thank you. Avery, WCAS. Governor Scott, the primary election is a week away, and just wanted to see how you were feeling about your chances and whether you plan to, if you were to get the nomination, to campaign more in the general. Um, well, we'll see what happens. You know, uh, it's a, a week away. Um, obviously, I've been focusing on the pandemic and my day job, and uh, we'll have to see what happens after. You know, with all these challenges coming our way, uh, I would like to be able to, to campaign more, uh, maybe in a more traditional sense, but uh, but again, the pandemic uh, comes first, and my day job comes first. So I'll be focusing on that and doing as much as I can in the after hours. Are you compared with your other um, your, your competitors, do you feel like you have a good chance going into it? I think I have as good a chance as any of my other competitors. OK, thank you. Guy Page. Governor, why is China sending Vermonters unidentified packets of seeds? And uh, do we know what kind of seeds they are? Uh, you've met with Consul General Hong Ping. Uh, have you notified him or other officials of any concern about this? And if so, what did they say? Um, it, that's a good question, Guy, yeah. and, and one that I asked uh, Secretary Tebbets uh, the other day because I wasn't uh, quite sure, uh, or and I haven't gotten the whole answer back, but. Uh, um, I wasn't sure what this even meant, what the seeds were. I don't think they know yet uh, what they would uh, what they would grow into. Um, and this is some sort of what they called a brushing uh, attempt. And uh, and and so I'm I'm not sure uh, of why uh, this is taking place, um, but it's some sort of marketing approach, uh, I believe. Um, so uh, we'll uh, I'll, I'm awaiting uh, some of the response, uh, but. Uh, but it's a great question. And no, I have not reached out to the uh, Chinese uh, delegation. I'm sure our, our Secretary of Agriculture is working on this. And, and I'm not even sure if we're the only state uh, who have received these seeds. Uh, but I believe that it's, uh, it's more broad than just Vermont. So um, I, I'll be happy to look into it. But I just don't know, have all the details at this point. But they're great questions. 
Thank you. Uh, the Vermont Superintendents Association told lawmakers last week about sharp fluctuations in enrollment, wants them to change the state education funding formula to protect schools against falling enrollments and COVID expenses. What are the total enrollment numbers right now compared with last year? And do you think that uh, for the reason stated that the formula, ed, ed formula is likely to change? Yeah, I think these are um, very unusual times. While we've seen a, a dramatic drop in the number of students over the last 20 years, I think I, I've uh, remarked uh, we've, we've lost about 30,000 students uh, down from about 103,000 down to 73 to 75,000 at this point. So we've seen a dramatic drop over the years uh, due to our demographics. Um, but the uh, pandemic uh, is going to be even um, even more volatile in some respects. I know that there are a number uh, of, uh, I've seen, I saw that there was an increase in the number of, of uh, parents asking for homeschooling. Um, we'll see uh, how, how dramatic that is. Yeah, I think it was doubled from last year. Um, but, uh, but I don't know uh, at this point um, about the numbers, uh, the actual numbers. And I, I might ask Secretary French if he has uh, any information he might be able to share. Yeah, thanks, Governor. Uh, we won't know those numbers until after the first month of school. Uh, that's when we complete what's called the census period, where we actually do a sampling and uh, calculate what's called the average daily membership. Um, so that's you know essentially the issue the superintendents were raising is that our methodology for doing that um, might not be easily to implement in the context of COVID-19. So it is something uh, we'll be talking to the legislature about is well, how do we do that census in the fall? But to your specific question, Guy, uh, we don't have those numbers yet, nor would we typically until October. Until October? We're not going to know how many students are in our schools until October? That's correct. Uh, there's a lot of, always, in any given year, there's always a lot of movement of families and so forth, so we have to wait for each they register at each school district and so forth, and then we go. Okay, thank you. I would say that there are going to be less than the 75,000 that we normally have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John Dillon, VPR. Thanks. Uh, just to continue on the testing vein here, if there are no appointments available for two weeks at pop up sites, that separate up in Canaan, um, I wondered if that was true. And secondly, our policy has been test to suppress. And are we confident, are you confident that we have the resources to do that, especially with college students coming back? I, I know UVMC is in different testing procedures and a, and a different lab, but the state may need to confirm. So given the, the likely increase in demand, do we have the capacity? Yeah, I'm not sure I got all of that, uh, John, but, uh, um, but that did catch my attention as well. Um, the the uh, number of uh, pop-up testing sites uh, were full, so I reached out to Secretary Smith, and I believe Dr. Levine has the answer uh, on that uh, issue. Um, in terms of capacity, you can ask, answer that as well, but we have uh, a good supply of inventory uh, at this point in time, but as we've seen uh, throughout the country, uh, I'm uh, I'm concerned uh, because uh, because other states have, have ramped up and are utilizing a lot of the the uh, testing supplies uh, for their own states and the commercial labs are are being uh, utilized and uh, which has slowed down the process for response. That's why I'm grateful uh, for the UVM lab as well as the uh, state lab uh, that we have here, our public health lab, uh, and our and we have uh, Broad in uh, Boston who's been doing an outstanding job for us and turning those results around. So at this point in time, we feel confident in our uh, testing uh, program. Uh, but, uh, but again, I always remain concerned based on you know what I don't know. Uh, and uh, because I, I obviously we don't have uh, control over the supplies on a national basis. So um, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, but at this point in time today, I feel confident uh, that we're, we're all set for the next month or two in terms of uh, the, the testing supplies and inventory. Dr. Levine? Yeah, there's a lot wrapped up in the question you've asked. And um, 
a lot of it has to do with the fact that in spite of what uh, your concern is, we continue to do a thousand plus tests a day. Um, and that has been very consistent and we still have the capacity to do that, as the governor said, for the next month or two as well. The goal is to keep our eye on that horizon because we know that the country is undergoing such a surge in request for testing and a problem with turnaround time in testing. So we have to be very, very aware of that all along. The goal in Vermont is still to try to do all the testing that we say we want to do, in spite of the previous question you may have heard. And we have a prioritization scheme. And clearly those who are symptomatic are at the top of the priority listing. Slightly down, but not too much further, are those who care for vulnerable populations, like the corrections population you've been hearing about, long-term care, healthcare workers, et cetera. And then lower down than that, but still called a priority, because it is, uh, are asymptomatic Vermonters who have some reason that they need to be tested. <clears throat> Perhaps their interaction with the healthcare system requires a test. Perhaps they are a contact that was uh, identified through contact tracing. Perhaps they are trying to get out of quarantine early uh, from travel out of state. The whole host of reasons. Um, those by necessity have to be at the bottom of the priority list, but they are still priorities because if we don't have that in the mix of our testing, not only have we disappointed all those people, but we've also not got a really good idea of what our positivity rate is and does it reflect reality. We've been talking a lot about Mississippi today, and I don't know it as of today, but the last time I looked at Mississippi, the percent positivity rate was 22 percent, um, compared to Vermont, which is now at 0.5 percent, and the Northeast, which of course is enjoying, I'll put that in quotes, a respite from what the rest of the country is experiencing, because we kind of were there first. Um, so 22 percent means, you know, any time you do a test, you've got a better than one in five chance that that test is going to be positive. That's pretty incredible. And if you extrapolate that, I know I'm not taking away uh, the fact that we've talked about what Core Civic is doing and not doing, and the governor and secretary have said what we would have liked to have done or not done earlier. I'm just stating fact. Based on my opening comments today, just like the schools, the prison environment is a microcosm of a community. So if the community that all of the staff in the prison work in has got a percent positivity rate of 22%, you might ask, how are you going to avoid having somebody come to work who's asymptomatic and doesn't know they harbor the virus? Hopefully, testing protocols that could prevent that would be helpful, but it wouldn't prevent people from having positive uh, test results. It would just allow you to identify them sooner. And who knows what the impact on the workforce might be uh, at a state that's experiencing a significant surge. So we want to maintain all of our testing capacity across all of those priority populations. We continue to work with the healthcare system in the state, medical centers, hospitals specifically, in terms of making sure that they're advised well about what to obtain for their testing and to what we call diversify the portfolio. So not every, every hospital in the state's dependent on the same supply chain and reagent chain. And if that ran out, we'd be stuck as a state. We want there to be some variety there. We will continue to do pop-ups and people should be persistent when they call about a pop-up to make sure that there truly hasn't been any opening up until the time that pop-up uh, actually takes place. And we want to uh, continue to follow new avenues. You've heard us talk about our interactions with Kinney Drugs, and uh, they are piloting something with us now, and we're on the verge of trying to expand that significantly throughout the state. The governor mentioned the Broad uh, in Boston, and uh, there are opportunities that we might be able to pursue with them, which we're also uh, continuing to work on, so that we, again, maintain that capacity that we want to have for the future, not just for now. And when or if 
turnaround time should be an issue everywhere, including the Northeast, like it is in some other parts of the country. We want to have enough established um, contacts and contracts that would allow us to hopefully capitalize on ones that are turning things around quicker than others. And in the midst of all of that, we are still using, as the Secretary's term, stockpile mentality, making sure that we try to make sure we have as much reagent on hand for the tests that we do do in state so that we're not at risk of running out precipitously uh, like happened in March when the country didn't have any uh, ability to respond. Did I cover most of what you asked about? Yes, thanks. Um, but for the governor, just very quickly, you mentioned that testing came up in this NGA call recently. And how much of a, uh, of a coordinated sort of multi-state response is happening to the national disparities in testing, given the lack of really any cohesive federal policy on this? Yeah, I'm not sure that there's any uh, formalized um, uh, plan working together. Obviously, the the National Governance Association is the call that I was on and uh, and heard many uh, talking about uh, the, the need uh, for more testing and the and the and the slowing down of some of these commercial entities so but I'm not I'm not aware of uh, any formalized uh, states working together on that I, I also John before you write the headline um, I wanted to go back and clarify something that I said um, just so that we're clear uh, when I said that we had enough inventory, uh, I was comf uh, comfortable with the inventory we had for the next uh, month or two. Um, that meant uh, if we stopped receiving any uh, inventory or stopped receiving any supplies tomorrow, we'd have enough for a month or two. Um, having said that, there has been no talk about uh, uh, reducing uh, or limiting or um, we haven't seen that the supply has stayed consistent, if not building, in some respects uh, from week to week. So I'm comfortable with where we are, uh, but I just want to make sure you understood. I wasn't saying that we're going to run out in a month or two. I'm saying if they stopped supplying us, we would. We'd have enough for a month or two. What was that, John? We uh, have. I think he's saying we have supply. He's just confirming we have supply still Yeah, John, if you uh, we couldn't hear uh, your comment, but if you said uh, we do have supplies coming in uh, every day, um, so and that's remained fairly consistent, if not uh, has has grown a bit uh, over the last uh, month. Certainly uh, over the last few months, but even over the last month, I've seen a steady increase. If, or leveling out, so um, I'm comfortable with where we're at at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Sorry about the connection. That's all right. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I, I want to ask you about the, the CARES money and where that's going to go. But uh, first of all, it, it sounds like, uh, Dr. Levine, that the testing question is still hanging out there. If someone is symptomatic and you talk about the syndromic surveillance you do on Fridays, um, you don't want that person hanging out there in the community. Why wouldn't they just go to a hospital which would have to take them in and treat them without them having to worry about signing up at a health center or going to the doctors? That whole bureaucracy. I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer that, but, to, but while uh, it isn't our first choice for someone to show up, um, they could sign up at a pop-up test. Uh, as well, that is still. I, I know that there's a uh, there's, there's a problem in uh, in the number of uh, people signing up at some of these pop up tests uh, at this point in time, uh, but um, but they can still do. They can take that approach. Dr. Levine. The last thing I want to be going on record for is to condone someone going to an emergency room setting for a non emergency. Um, so I won't, I won't say that. I mean, that's always an option that's available for someone. But, you know, there are also urgent care centers, um, and there are phone calls to health care providers when you know your health care provider and they know your medical history and can authorize a test at a location where you can actually get the test. 
But if the healthcare provider feels that you are a very strong candidate for COVID-19 based on what you've told them, your isolation begins then. And even if you got the test that day and it didn't come back for two days, you're still supposed to be in isolation. So I want to stress that. Uh, the right course of action is to be advised appropriately about the likelihood you have the condition and then do the right thing. And the right thing would be uh, isolating yourself, assuming you were stable in other ways and didn't need urgent health care, uh, and then await your test result. And if your test didn't come for two days or so, uh, but the likelihood was considered very strong based on um, the diagnostic criteria that your health care provider was uh, applying, um, you still stay isolated uh, until further notice, just like we tell people don't show up at work um, if you don't feel well. Uh, this would be especially important in that case. All right, thanks for clearing that up. Governor, the um, Vermont uh, CBS, uh, Vermont Public Radio poll just came out and you received a very high Marks ranked 80 percent on your pandemic response. But one of the other questions was on um, the budget, and by a two to one margin, the respondents say they would rather uh, see tax revenues go up rather than um, programs being cut. And I'm wondering. Um, I know. I know your views are on that, but I, I want to get your response. I, I wonder what. Do you know how granular? I didn't look at the poll, um, Tim, but I wonder how granular they they got. What what taxes were the uh, were Vermonters willing to accept? What what was, taxes was, do they no, want? Like do the, they want to pay? That was the, the it was a very broad question, and that was basically the answer. Fifty four percent preferred um, raising revenues versus twenty eight percent cutting. So I guess it depends. You know. Nobody minds a, a tax increase uh, as long as it doesn't affect themselves, I guess. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, a, a sales tax increase or uh, uh, rooms and meals or, or something or income tax or, or something, they might they might care a little bit more uh, than if they just thought it magically came from someone else. So uh, my theory has always been, uh, you know, raising taxes is always a last resort. Uh, there's other uh, approaches we can take. Uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We've been fortunate to receive a lot of money uh, from the federal government, which has helped our economy in a lot of different respects. Uh, there may be more uh, coming uh, down uh, the pike, so to speak. Um, so um, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when it comes. Um, but I believe uh, we, can, so we can get through this without raising taxes. Uh, that would be my method. In, uh, you're re referencing the, the CARES Act limitations as, as far as the front line workers are concerned, but there are other restrictions that you can't use it for the budget, you can't use it for unemployment insurance either. But as, as I recall, there's about $100 million left. What would you recommend the legislature do with that, that pretty substantial amount of money left? Well, actually, I think, uh, I think you're going to find there's going to be a little bit more money uh, because as you might remember, we we somewhat borrowed against the CARES money uh, to get us through uh, the last fiscal year, thinking that we were going to have a deficit. Uh, well, lo and behold, it appears uh, we're going to have a surplus. Um, so that freed up uh, some more of that CARES money. So we should have more than just $100 million. Uh, that's to be determined. We'll work with the legislature. A lot's going to det uh, be determined on what Congress does uh, in allowing for more flexibility, uh, what is going to be allowed, what's not. Uh, right now, our hands are tied in, in a lot of different respects. Uh, but if they gave us some flexibility, uh, that may free uh, free up the money to be utilized for something that would give us the highest return. And that would be my goal: is to to find ways uh, that we can invest in areas that would uh, would help us uh, in the in the longer term, rather than just look at the short term. Let's look at the longer term if we have. Uh, extra money, but we'll see. Again, uh, they're still uh, talking in in Washington. Uh, we'll see if they uh, they come up with some other uh, provision. I would I would dare say something's going to happen. Just don't know what it's going to be. Well, that, and also that uh, 
under the, the current rules that the money has to be allocated by the end of this year, which is you know, happening fast. Yeah, that, so that's part happen. of the flexibility that I'm talking about. It's not just about whether you can utilize the money for, for budgetary purposes, but uh, giving us some flexibility in terms of expending that money, um, maybe going beyond uh, the end of the year would be tremendously helpful to us. All right, great, thank you. Lisa Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question for uh, Secretary French and a not too bold question for Secretary Curley. We're hearing a lot about small groups of parents creating learning pods to help their kids with distance, distance learning, even hiring tutors to work with their children. We've also heard people concerned that this creates better educational opportunities for those who can afford to create pods for those who can't afford pods and tutors. Does the Agency of Education have a position on how these private pods square with the principles of Act 60, which calls for substantially equal educational opportunities for all students? Hi, Lisa. I think I caught the question. You're breaking up a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I'm understanding that the, the sort of movement nationally as well in Vermont on the, the pod issue with parents coming together to do that. And I think, you know, as, as we said earlier, um, you know, reopening plans aren't perfect. Um, but on the other hand, you do need some parts and flexibility to local districts. So I am I'm very concerned about equal opportunity and uh, going forward into the fall and the summer. Um, We'll be collecting data on these patterns uh, so we can better understand uh, where the opportunities are not being provided. Thank you. And for Secretary Curley, um, I had a local business ask me, they had applied for state grants through the ACCD portal, and they were listed as recommended, they been listed for recommended for approval since July 17th. They would like to know if recommended for approval means that there are sufficient funds for them to receive a grant, and if so, when can they expect to receive those funds? I think we have Commissioner Goldstein on as oh, well. Oh, sorry. Might... If uh, Secretary Curley may not are be on the call. Okay. I'm, I'm on. I'm sorry. I was okay. Um, so I, it was very broken up, but I believe there is somebody who applied for grant funds who may have received um, that they've been recommended for approval, but, but have not yet heard that they are officially approved. And they're wondering That's if there will be, okay, and wondering if there will be grant funds available should they be approved. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Correct. So, yes, okay. So yes, at this moment, everybody who is in the queue awaiting final approval, there, there are funds available to cover all of those apps. So if they're in the queue and they've received um, recommended for approval. If they receive final approval, they will um, be able to um, get the grant fund at this point. And is there an estimated time frame? They've been recommended for approval since July 17th. I would, um, I would just encourage them to, to send me an email and I can follow up on it. But what I will say is that uh, if they apply through the ACCD um, format, we have a very um, hands-on review process and it takes quite some time and we still have, I want to say about 400 applications that are in the queue um, awaiting final approval. So we've been getting through quite a bit, um, but there, there are still some in there and there are applications coming in every day, but it would be probably helpful for us to just double check and see if there's a reason it's stuck. Great, I'll share that information with them, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, Chris. Brattleboro Reformer. Chris Mays, Brattleboro Reformer. Star six to unmute, Chris. All right, we'll go to Aaron at BT Digger. Aaron Patango. A question about this. Hi. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a question about the status of libraries um, under the latest guidance. Um, you know, as libraries reopen, it, our evaluation of them seems like they have a lot of 
different approaches they're taking, um, you know, in terms of the number of hours they're open, the number of people they'll allow into the library, the services they provide. Um, is there any effort for the state to further kind of provide guidance or clarity or standardization to what libraries should be doing at this point in the pandemic? I don't have the answer uh, myself, Aaron, but uh, I might ask either Secretary Curley or Secretary Young if uh, they might have uh, something to add to that. I'm not, this is Secretary Curley. I might let uh, Secretary Young or Secretary Young have a comment on that. Again, it sounds like maybe libraries, I'm sorry, it's very broken up today, but the libraries um, maybe are, are operating very differently from one another. and. You know, we have guidance that makes them to operate and that's why they may be choosing to do it differently. Secretary Young, are you on? Aaron, I will, uh, I will have somebody reach out to you directly and uh, see if we can um, bring some clarity to that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just have a follow-up if you sure. think you could get clarification on that, um, about the classification of libraries. They were originally classified as retail for the purposes of closures and reopening, and then got moved to arts and culture. I was wondering if anyone could answer why that move happened, and if there's any discussion of putting them in their own category, considering that they have kind of a unique role in you know, public service and for I, I, I don't have the answer, um, but I believe uh, they're put in arts and culture uh, to give just that flexibility uh, to increase the amount of capacity. I think we went to maybe 75 percent uh, for arts and culture, uh, and it was, a, it was a way, and retail was at 25 percent, uh, as, you, uh, as you might remember. So um, I think it was to give them uh, that flexibility that you were um, advocating for. Um, Secretary Curley, yeah. anything you can add to that? I would just, um, Aaron, I would just encourage you to reach out um, again, or I, I'll reach out to you, but uh, between Deputy Secretary Brady and myself, I think we can um, give you sort of the history of how that evolved and um, would be happy to do that. Okay, so I have to start with the, the phone issues. Governor, this is Secretary Young. Sorry about that. Um, I would just respond to um, the question first by saying uh, our state librarian and his team have done a fantastic job working with all of the uh, public um, and school libraries across the state through the pandemic to ensure that they were able to deliver um, so many needed services to Vermonters. And the, the challenge with the uniformity uh, primarily is that most of these libraries operate um, under the control of municipalities and other governance structures. So um, they are you know, uh, operating within those, those confines and not as um, state entities. So that is one reason why you, you see some lack of uniformity uh, around the libraries. Um, we did start uh, with treating them as retail when, when the spigot started opening. Uh, and I, and I, what I will do is refer you to our state librarian who can really give you um, an idea of the evolution of how libraries have operated through the pandemic uh, to achieve maximum utility for all Vermonters. Okay, thank you. Kevin, seven days. Hi, Governor, can you hear me? We can. I think the majority of my questions are for Secretary Smith, that's all right. That's, that's fine with me, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of these questions involve um, the Mississippi situation. The first one is whether Vermont inmates down there are segregated from the rest of the population. My understanding, Kevin, they are segregated from the rest of the population. The, the, what we're doing now is segregating within, within the, the, uh, within the pop Vermont population from positive and negatives. So that is uh, ongoing right now. Got it. And so when you said that you were requesting uh, that um, the, the operator of that facility 
to facility-wide testing, did you mean the entire facility, or did you mean only the area where the Vermont folks are located? Because I think that uh, facility has a 2,800 inmates. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was talking about the seg segregated facility that houses Vermont inmates, but I also was talking about any employee of that um, of that facility that may enter that segregated facility. You know if that. Uh, is reasonable? Like, do they have a rotating shift of employees, or is, are there dedicated uh, employees to the Vermont uh, uh, inmates? I don't know the answer to that. It's reasonable to me. Okay. Uh, the next question I have is, um, you mentioned a lot of things that you want them to do. And literally, you listed about six or eight things that you want this uh, private company to do. But that says to me that they haven't they haven't agreed to do those things yet. Can you separate what you've asked them to do versus what they've agreed to do? Yeah, I think we're in pretty much agreement to the things that I have listed. Um, I'll, you know, I'll check with, uh, Kevin, I'll check with Commissioner Baker on the latest status of this, but everything I listed is something that um, I believe has been talked about and agreed to. The logistics of how to do it still haven't been worked out, but the agreement of making sure that um, that list is complied with is something that um, I, I think there's general agreement with. Okay, and at any point in the conversation with, um, with this organization, was, was there any protest made about the cost of what you were requesting? Because I would imagine that any additional cost protesting would be borne by them as for the contract, is that mm -hmm. fair? Yeah, I was not specifically in those uh, conversations between Core Civic and uh, the Department of Corrections. Uh, I don't know what the issue of uh, cost is and what it will be, but I will tell you this, this is what we do in Vermont, this is what we will do in Mississippi. Then I guess I'm wondering who's gonna bear that cost, we'll, if you don't. We'll work it out. I don't know yet. Okay. And and then the last question is, it may be for you or the governor um, or a combo, but it's pretty clear that construction of a new modern correctional facility in the state of Vermont, even if the legislature became enamored with that proposal, would take years and years, um, or let's just say years. Um, is there any interim step between uh, that and housing more than 200 inmates you know, in a, in a, in a state far away? Uh, where there's been some demonstrated uh, issues with having them follow protocols uh, as expected? Yeah, hey, Kevin, you know for years we've been uh, using out-of-state facilities. Um, as you mentioned, this isn't going to change overnight, but if we don't start, um, it'll never change. And uh, what, I, what uh, you heard the governor say and what I am advocating is we really got to get serious about this. And um, and the, the, frankly, we'll probably u be using out-of-state facilities in the interim. Why we move uh, to, in, you know, why we discuss, fund, construct, and move to a new facility. But at the same time, if we don't start now, then we'll be longer out of state. And I'll, I'll let the governor. Yeah, <clears throat> Kevin, I, I might add, uh, as everyone is probably aware, uh, we've reduced our our offender population overall dramatically uh, through the pandemic. How long that will last, I don't know. I mean, we're not in total control of that. We have the facilities and we have to maintain the facilities and we have to uh, make sure that we have a place to put people. Um, but, um, but with justice reinvestment, um, that uh, might have uh, some, uh, some benefits uh, in terms of trying to keep the population down. Um, but uh, the, and the judiciary has a role to play as well. I mean, they uh, they are the ones that uh, that put them through the process to determine if they're in uh, go, go into incarceration or not. Uh, so they play a role. So we need to have this conversation as we work our way through this. If if we could uh, magically get to a, a place where we have a vaccine, uh, we don't have to have this additional capacity within each facility, um, and we didn't grow the population any further, uh, we could bring them back. Uh, we could put them back in the infrastructure uh, just ba based on the on the uh, the net number uh, of uh, 
number of uh, offenders that we have been have reduced uh, over this period of time because I believe it's been like 300 uh, 300 and something uh, is the number that is in my head um, so uh, that would account you know we we would have the capacity uh, to bring them back if we didn't need to uh, to increase that in some some respect that's what I'm trying to get at I was a little surprised to hear the focus be returning to the construction of a, of a multi-million dollar uh, you know correctional facility in the state in a time when we're seeing a sharp drop in the number of inmates in the state so I, I and so I was thinking you'd be more maybe pivoting to focus more on the justice reinvestment and the reduction of the population and in, in an effort to possibly return out-of-state prisoners to the state without building such a large facility with a large investment. Yeah, um, well, I, I think it all has to happen at the same time, Kevin, uh, because uh, the infrastructure is dilapidated. Uh, if you've gone through, like, the Chittenden uh, facility, uh, you know that it needs to be replaced. Um, so we're finding that throughout uh, the system. So regardless of the size, uh, and again, we can be flexible on the size uh, to have a, a more modern updated facility um, would, uh, would uh, be beneficial for all involved. So I think we have to have the conversation concurrently. Even if we were to bring everyone back, it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't fill the need uh, that we have to replace the existing infrastructure. Got it. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Yep. All right, Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello. Hello, I think I have a question for Secretary Smith and one for Secretary French. Um, Secretary Smith, um, I understand there are a number of out-of-state inmates in other facilities around the country. Um, have you been in contact with all those facilities and are you assured that those inmates are being treated uh, in accordance with Vermont standards. Yeah, uh, Joe, you're, what you're saying is we have, the Department of Corrections has prisoners in other facilities throughout the country. I'm not aware of that, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, it, but I'm not aware of that. Okay, well, um, I thought, um, Commissioner Baker said something to that effect in his news conference yesterday, but I can I can easily check on that. Yeah, and I guess and it may it may be that um, somebody is picked up in another part of the country of a parole virus. I'm just speculating, Joe, on a parole violation or something. But before I go speculating, um, let me uh, have the commissioner follow up with you on that. Thank you very, thank you very much. I guess you have to hook them. Thank you. Secretary French, um, I got a message from a reader who is um, worried about uh, the possibility of children in her family being uh, infected with COVID if they go back to school and is planning to um, homeschool the children in accordance with the state regulations <laughs> on schooling. But at the same time, she is very concerned about the effect that this might have on uh, the local community school by reducing the um, the student count for the school and thus costing it revenue. Is there anything that you can say that might ease her mind or uh, is this something she needs to take into account when deciding what to do? Yeah, it, I think that's a great question. It's just uh, representative of, you know, the cause of some of these, uh, a lot of the anxiety that we see, uh, not only with teachers, but also parents and students. Uh, you know, the first thing I'd say to her is do what's best for her, her child. I mean, that's I mean, the first obligation of any parent. In terms of the funding, uh, you know, we had a question earlier in the conference call about uh, the number of students and how we take attendance and so forth. And that's, I think, part of what she's asking. I think, personally, you know, she should do what's best for a student, and then we will uh, seek to address issues relative to uh, the ADM count and so forth of the legislature. 
uh, clearly this is these are unique situations and um, it's something I think we're going to have to address uh, regardless because our statutory language on uh, FCLA membership doesn't really line up with uh, how we're going to reopen schools in the fall. Thank you very much. Hey, Joe, um, not just to speculate a little bit further, um, and we'll check with Commissioner Baker on what exactly he meant, but there could be Vermonters, there are Vermonters, I'm sure, who have committed crimes in other states that are incarcerated in those states. Okay, I, I, I imagine that's a possibility. I'm not sure that that's what he was speaking of, but um, uh, I'm assuming that uh, Secretary Smith will, you know, check with Commissioner Baker and I'll hear something sooner or later. He will. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Oh, great. Thank you all for tuning in and uh, we'll see you again on Friday.